ever wondered what makes our experts tick? You're about to find out as we unlock more secrets from the Roadshow archives. In the interest of balance, tonight we're making room for both ends of the scale when it comes to the appreciation of antiques. Two of our longest standing roadshow experts will reveal the finest objects to come their way in 30 years on the show, pieces they'd love to own. Do you like it? And on the flip side, we'll be finding out why some owners simply can't stand their heirlooms, no matter what the specialists say about them. They're not a pair, I should say they are. And roadshow veteran Eric Knowles remembers the first time he stepped in front of the cameras. Way back in 1981, I was 28 years of age, which is remarkable, because I'm only 32 now. And Catherine Higgins explains why she thinks kitchen collectibles can be a smart buy. If the trend continues, yes, I think we're going to see prices going up. Not too high, I hope, so I can still buy a few things myself. Now, you may be surprised to learn that if you ask one of our experts the day after a roadshow which item they like the best, they often can't remember a single thing. Perhaps it's not so surprising when you think they can see thousands of pieces flash before their eyes on a typical day. So imagine how special a piece must be if they can still picture them with affection five, ten, even twenty years later. They must really be something. David Batty from the ceramics team and John Bly from the furniture desk now pick out the best of their roadshow finds. Oh, is that this little one is uh, honey. I think it's yes. sweet. And it is probably the most wonderful piece of furniture I've seen. It's a staggeringly good example of its kind. Unsurpassable. I had no idea. Well, it doesn't happen very often, but when something wonderful does appear, I mean, it is a great thrill. I think probably the first thing that occurs to me when something amazing is unwrapped is this has got to be a forgery. No way could this be happening here. There is nothing that can describe adequately the thrill when you find something that is really, really wonderful. And although I say it's rare that they do turn up, enough times to make it uh, imperative that you do another programme just to find out. Well, I am delighted you've brought this in. For me, this is the most exciting object I've seen on any roadshow. It's absolutely marvellous. It's Japanese earthenware, what's called satsuma ware, and it's a fantastic example of its kind. When a really interesting thing marvelous. is presented to me, um, I, um, I'm more than happy. The body is enamelled and gilt with the, in the most wonderful way with Tokugawa Mon, which are the badges of the princely house of Tokugawa. I'm glad you brought it in, it's terrific. Paul really is one of the programmes which has, has stuck in my mind, largely because of a Satsuma Ewer that came in, um, sort of pear-shaped with a dragon spout. And the spout and the handle are just one sinuous dragon, brilliantly modelled. I mean, you can see it's almost alive. And I get hopelessly besotted by objects. <laughs> Uh, my house is a testament to that. At the moment, I should think this is probably worth about six to eight hundred pounds. As much as that? Mm -hmm. It's my belief that this particular type of wear is going to prove in the long term an extraordinarily good investment. I'm the sure Satsuma Ewer would have increased in value and then crashed because it hit another recession. And at the moment, I would be surprised if that ewer made more than two and a half thousand. Quite extraordinary. And it's ridiculous. It's a really superb object. It doesn't make any sense at all. I think the one piece that stands out um, beyond all others, as far as rarity, equality, and to me, beauty, has to be the commode in the Isle of Man which, looking back, has to be about 25 years ago. She was left to me by an elderly lady who I was very fond of. This is probably the most important piece of furniture that's ever been shown on a roadshow. Yes. 
It's quite extraordinary, and I would think, without any doubt, the most valuable piece too, but more of that later. It had absolutely everything that one would hope for in an important piece of furniture. Fantastic thing. It stood as if it could have walked off the stage. It was just so full of life and movement. And then it was covered with marquetry, and this beautiful marquetry was again, all, it was foliate, but they were, they were flowers that you could have picked off the surface. Ah! The leaves on here would be green, the rosebuds pink, and there you would have a bright blue ribbon. So you have all these bright, sparkling colours that come down. And once you've seen that, you know, you say, look at that, isn't that great? It's a piece of furniture that is of national importance, and even on international scale. It was made by one of three or four people, possibly a man called Pierre Longlois. It was made by a cabinet maker who had a workshop in Paris and a workshop in London. And in Paris, he was known as Pierre Longlois, and in London, he was known as Peter Langley, which I think is wonderful history. Having said all that, I must tell you that it's a piece of furniture which could realize 35 to 40,000 pounds. No wonder you asked me to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I've had two or three things of that sort of combined construction and look, but nothing ever as important and as beautiful as that. No, it was lovely. Oh, I'd love another one. <laughs> yes, occasionally we get items so good, even the experts are queuing up to share the limelight. We have here what looks to me like a piece of oriental porcelain with a Western Victorian mount. Uh, Skegness, that was the Burgess bottle that was just... Mwah. Now, do you know who William Burgess is? No, apart from his name on the... On the but bottle. that doesn't mean anything to you? Not a lot, no. Right, where do we begin? <laughs> um, we could be here for hours. <laughs> One of the most important Victorian designers yes. of architecture. William Burgess was this extraordinary designer and he did do small objects and what he usually did was to take something that already existed and then build round it. And this was a little Chinese bottle which he had netted in gold. This particular piece he made for himself. How do you know he made it for himself? Right. Um, <laughs> Two reasons. <laughs> One is he actually bothered to put his name on the bottom. Now, he's not just saying, I made it. He put the names on things that were for the owner. Therefore, we know that this he made for himself. I mean, the money to me is, is not the important thing. What's important to me is the object. Objects are not inanimate. They will tell you a story. Furthermore, there is a set of photographs of his house taken in the 19th century by Francis Bedford. The album is in the v &A in London, and this bottle is illustrated in that book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as a, is it really? And it hasn't mm -hmm. been seen since. since. No. It's, it's a discovery. And that story is really the drama and the excitement of the roadshow. Yes. OK, well, let's go, yes. come up with a price. What do we think? We well, where do we start? begin? Ten. Pounds? <laughs> Thousand? A thousand pounds. No, ten thousand pounds. I'll no. I'll raise you on that. Twenty. I have to consult my um, client. Um, <laughs> Twenty-five. I think somewhere around twenty to thirty thousand. Do you really? Absolute top. Yes. How amazing. Yep. It's so, a wonderful. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Place. Never seen before. No. We won't see it again. One sold um, sometime later for, uh, I think, 20,000 or 25,000. So we were in the right kind of area. Thank you. Wow. I'm so pleased I brought it. I remember at Wisley, this very charming lady had brought in this great cupboard. It was one of those things that you could see across the room and you know it's going to be good. This was of its type. Well, this is magnificent English furniture from the third quarter of the 19th century, between 1860 and 1880. 19th century furniture is, 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 is not my first love, but quality is. I mean, it, it was incredible. It was given to me 10 years ago as a wedding present from a great aunt. Um, she had emigrated to South Africa some 20 or 30 years before and had been in storage in Edinburgh for all of that time. It just arrived? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> I was trying at the time to think of some intelligent questions to ask and not doing very well because he obviously knows a great deal about these things and I know very little indeed. If we can trace it to a maker, then this piece of furniture would be 
in excess of £100,000. <laughs> Honestly, I nearly burst into tears because I was so... In, it was such an intense experience that it was quite shocking at the time. But don't worry, we haven't found him yet. <laughs> Good. And her reaction was one of total joy and disbelief and then more joy. If we can't, if we can't, then I'm afraid it'd only be worth about £50,000. <laughs> but what I was so thrilled about was that we discussed the matter afterwards and she and I have been doing research on the cabinet since then. When John said, if I could prove the provenance, it was potentially worth sort of £100,000, and if I couldn't, it was worth half of that, yes, I was very inspired to, to find out more. Obviously, there is a monetary value, but it wasn't really that. We were never intending to sell it. It was more, I just wanted to find out more about it, because clearly it was unique, and it was made for somebody. We traced it to a family called the Baird family, George Alexander Baird and his wife Cecilia, which is the intertwined monogram on the front. They lived in a place called Stitchell Mansion, which no longer exists. But we found the local postmistress, Mary Thompson, who'd been there for 30 years, and she was something of a local historian. And a few years later, we were travelling up to Edinburgh and went to Stitchell, met with Mary, and she lives in one of the lodge houses of the original mansion house. And as we drove up, we could see on the lodge gates the intertwined C and G Baird, and on the reverse side was the griffin, which is on the front of the credenza. So we felt immediately we'd found its home. It has to be my best of the best, because that has everything. A, a marvellous piece of furniture, good provenance, a lovely owner, and continuing discovery. Absolute quality antiques there. And one man who knows quality when he sees it is the Roadshow's Art Deco man, Eric Knowles. He's been on the show for 28 years, man and boy. Normally, he's never stuck for words, but there was one day when he struggled, the very first time he stepped in front of the camera. Stand by to flash back to the 80s for the first recorded glimpse of our Eric. I was as nervous as... Well, I mean, I did really well to master the shaking. Can you tell me anything about them yourself? I mean, where have they come well, from? When we purchased the house, the small chair was in the under the stairs, and the big one was in the hall. So they've been left by the previous That's tenants, right. yeah. is that right? Way back in 1981, I was 28 years of age, which is remarkable, because I'm only 32 now. These date from round about 1900, and it really is very, very individual in style. I mean, to look at the chairs, you might be forgiven for thinking that they are Indian. In actual fact, they've been nowhere near India. I'd really been brought onto the programme just to work on the front counter, uh, but the producer came up to me after about half an hour and said, look, you see those chairs over there, do you recognise who they're by? And I said, well, yeah, they're by Bugatti. He said, and do you know anything about... I said, well, yes, I do know a few things about Bugatti. So we'll go up there and do a record. And when you think of Bugatti, you automatically think of the, the racing cars. Well, Carlo um, was the father of Ettore, who was the designer of racing cars. If it hadn't been for the show's veterans preferring more traditional furniture, Eric might never have got the chance to step in front of the cameras. The whole effect of this cabinet is absolutely magnificent. It is a glorious bit of furniture. My relationship with Arthur Negus, what can I say? Certainly, if anything 20th century came onto the programme, he'd look at it in disdain and say, uh, I haven't got a clue, show it the lad, he'll probably know what it is. Because I don't think he ever really knew my name. This use of metal or copper banding is again typical of Bugatti. I'd explained about the copper peaks, and uh, once the camera stopped rolling, this chap started talking. And he said, you know, these copper peaks, he said, our back garden, I keep digging up lots of these copper peaks. I mean, they're, all, they're in an area of charred wood. And it, it dawned on me what had happened, that basically the previous owner of the house who'd left these behind under the stairwell had taken a, a Bugatti dining room suite and put it on the bonfire. And uh, sale room value would probably be in the region of 800 to 1,000 pounds. What a crime. And uh, talking of crimes... When it comes to the suit, the main reason I bought that size is that, that also fitted me dad. Like it or not, you can't ignore it. It really yeah. is very, very individual, as I said. 
and we I used to send it up to him um, on the on the Red Star uh, parcel post uh, uh, for him to go to job interviews in, and uh, it worked on three occasions. Is that really true? Of course, it's not. <laughs> Eric Knowles, who always claims he was barely out of short trousers when that recording was made. A lot of the items we see at the Antiques Roadshow are carefully repacked after their visit, and inevitably they'll return to glass cabinets and mantelpieces. But one of our specialists, Catherine Higgins, believes that the pieces you use every day can end up the collectibles of the future. Get out of that bed, wash your face and hands. I'm a great fan of um, vintage kitchenalia and all things to do with homewares. I love the 50s because it was a really exciting time to be in the kitchen and it was a time when things were both functional and good looking and I think the combination of the two meant that the housewife got these great new gadgets that she could use. And that's why it's very exciting to bring them to life again and I really enjoy doing that. Life could be a dream, sweetheart. This is the place I come for my shopping fix. I love burrowing around and seeing if I can find my favourite things. Even the most perfect 50s housewife wouldn't have had this level of choice. It's like a sort of real time warp experience here, and I love it. I think, certainly, there are a band of collectors who love to buy 1950s things, and these really set off other pieces that they might have bought, the grander pieces, you know, the, the really nice armchair or the sofa, something like that. I think there are a number of people like me who, who buy to use, and, um, you know, if, if the trend continues, yes, I think we're going to see prices going up. Not too high, I hope, so that I can still buy a few things myself. The new materials and, and new kitchenwares that came out in the 1950s were very revolutionary. Firms like Pyrex had already existed pre-war, but post-war, they, they go in a new direction. They're restyled for a younger audience, and it was the first time, really, they could actually afford modern design. I think I love these things because they're a lot of the things that I actually grew up with. Um, for instance, this was my porridge bowl, not this particular one, but a bowl exactly like this was my porridge bowl when I was about, my first memories of using it, about three or four or something like that. And I don't want to spend fortunes on antiques. I think it's great to spend as much as your, you know, your small purse can afford, really. And so this, this sort of stuff at 10 or 12 pounds, the perfect buy. Home cooking, home cooking. I love the original recipe books and uh, leaflets, which are great. And they kind of just show how, how perfect you had to be as a housewife. You had to prepare everything so it looked amazing. And then you had to move for the next minute to do some sewing for the children. And then you had to be able to do knitting. So you were a sort of multitasking machine that just sort of uh, managed to make it all perfect and produce, you know, the, the smile at the end of the day. We dock to bake a sunshine cake It does more good than a big thick steak We'll start I start with a, a tablespoon of trouble Then I then add a smile and let it bubble Well, I think until 1954, things were pretty hard and the recipes I'm doing today is quite interesting because it's, it's sheer extravagance in terms of what there was. Um, you know, I'm using sausages which were so rarely seen. I mean, you almost had to bribe the butcher to get a, a, a sausage. So things changed enormously when rationing ended. And you can see that, I mean, by 1958, we've got recipes that use, goodness knows, five or, or four or five eggs. And the weekly ration was only one egg if you were really lucky. So the whole culture surrounding food changed as the decade progressed, really. Design on tableware was really influenced by what was going on in cookery. And as more exotic food came to the market, factories like Midwinter began decorating their pottery with garlic and red peppers and even asparagus. And these were things that many families had never seen before. These days, saladware designed by Terence Conran commands the really high prices. But personally, I prefer to collect um, more humble and affordable homewares by the likes of designers like Jesse Tate. An average red domino plate would be maybe eight or nine pounds. But if you're talking about the same plate 
in saladware, you're talking, you know, certainly 20, 30 pounds or so, something like that. I would love to be able to buy perhaps a really great piece of saladware, but um, I'm going to have to save up quite hard. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. I think the, the 50s values are very much in, in our minds. It's quite interesting, really, in the, the, the times of, I, I guess, credit crunch. We're all thinking about how much things cost and you know how to save money. Well, you could be a 1950s girl and save money quite nicely because the ingredients, of course, were very fresh. You were using products that didn't have additives or any real e-numbers to talk about. And it was a time when you could make things yourself. You know, you were, as a housewife, you would do much more yourself than we do now. And if you can do all of that, it's a tremendous money saver. And I think, you know, let's apply those values today. Um, my friends, I think, think I'm slightly, slightly mad, but they don't necessarily share my obsession with the 1950s and 1950s food, but they, they really enjoy sharing the results. And I'm generally known as the Nigella Lawson of the antiques world amongst my friends. I don't know why. Now I'm going to put my sausage and egg tart, 1950s style, in the oven. And luckily, here's one I made earlier. It looks... I must say, it smells delicious and it looks delicious. There we go. Tea time, anyone? Mr. Even I might consider spending a bit longer in the kitchen if I could have some of Catherine's collection. But taste can be a funny thing. What's a prized possession to one person can be an absolute monstrosity to another. We see it time and time again on the roadshow. As the expert gets excited, the owners Far from convinced. It's hard to believe, but these next few owners just can't stand their antiques. I'm going to conduct an experiment. Do you like it? Not a lot, no. Do you like it? No. no. It's horrible. No, I've never liked it hugely. The fact that other people said they didn't like it didn't surprise me. Didn't defend me either. <laughs> it's a little Martin Brothers bird made out of stoneware. In theory, they were tobacco jars, but I think that one was probably too small to get any serious amount of tobacco in. And today, it's probably worth £10,000. <laughs> my daughter's standing behind you and my granddaughter, and they're both <laughs> salivating. And it's mine, not yours, it's mine. My opinion after the filming and probably changed a little, but it's nice to know that one actually has got something that is potentially worth quite a bit of money. And the end of my experiment is now, do you like it? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how money can change taste? Ah, but there are some people who hate their antiques so much they won't change their minds, no matter what you say. Penzler's place, I got a family delegation. They'd come to bring along their Moorcroft bull. Is this one of your prized possessions? I think it's very ugly. You do? Yeah. Can I ask, uh, I mean, you don't have to agree with your wife. I've always found it safer to do so. <laughs> but yes, I think it is after all these years. But okay. she loves all the bright colours. It's a bit too somber, yes. isn't it? Now, I'm very fond of Moorcroft pottery, it goes without saying. As much as I might eulogise about this thing, there was no way I was going to make any impression on her. Yeah, you're quite sure about that? I'm um, positive. Now, why, why, where does it stand in your home at the moment? Top of the wardrobe, covered up. There were so many thousands of people looking at this thing on screen thinking, oh, I'd love that, I've loved that, you know. Um, but no, and no matter what, I said about it, it didn't make any difference. Um, it's an unusual shape, is this? And the combination um, of the shape and the decoration sort of add to the value. Somebody could well easily offer you two and a half thousand pounds for this. Even when I told the lady in question that it was worth two and a half thousand pounds, that make any difference to me? But not as no, much as you were before. No, no, no. Can I ask your daughter? Yes, you ask her. What, what, do, you, what do you think? think? Well, I don't really like it, but I think I'd keep it. It's a little bit like saying, wow, what a wonderful E-type. Don't care, stays in the garage. You know, I mean, same thing. OK, but promise me you don't... You won't put any apples and oranges in it. No, no. I'll no. put it back where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very nice meeting you all. <laughs> Some antiques are so detested, they've even been the cause of trouble and strife in the marital home. One of the most um, memorable recordings I did was at Althrop. 
two lovely, lovely dolls. Now tell me. If I'm valuing something and the owner tells me they hate it, it gives me the leeway to say, thank God you said that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> Did you buy them for your wife? I did, yes. You yes. did? Yeah, I did, yes. What a lucky wife. Mm. Tell did me you know about what it. what she said? No. I don't want them awful things. I said... <laughs> <laughs> when Bernard bought the dolls, I said, well, I don't really like those. They're a bit dirty, aren't they? That's a terrible thing to say. Yeah. How can you say that's tatty? <laughs> Look at that. It's wonderful. <laughs> Do you mind telling me what to pay? We try 150 pounds. Maybe that's why you didn't like them so much. <laughs> and I said, well, if I say that you put a naught on for each one, she said, could you say that again? No. Would you like them a bit better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll have them back now. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. I don't know about a surprise. <laughs> I didn't get any sense, did it? Oh, what? £1,500 each. Each? <laughs> I did ask the wife afterwards, come on, seriously, are you going to sell those? So she, she said, well, I thought I might do to go on a cruise. Well, we're still looking at the cruises, but we haven't gone on it yet, but we, we are thinking about it. Eric encountered yet another hated item. This one almost caused a family feud. Well, not many years ago, we were in Wigan, and um, a couple uh, brought in their family cabinet, which the lady described as being the family monstrosity. It has been uh, christened the monstrosity um, really? by the family, and it's, it's known affection. affectionally as the monstrosity. Do you know, I... I dream about being a member of a family like yours because <laughs> if they all hate it, it means that eventually it might come my way. <laughs> my parents-in-law were buying a table from an auction. The people that were selling the table said, well, you can't have the table unless you buy the cabinet. Right, so it was forced on her. Yes. Uh, virtually, yes. Okay. yes. Well, I've got to say, 40 years ago, this type of furniture was, um, was not particularly desirable. It was definitely not really wanted on the day it arrived. But over the years, yes, it's become very, very, very much part of the family. If I wanted to go out and, uh, and buy that today, I would have to go out with £6,000 in my pocket. Gosh. I don't think there'd be Gosh. any problems in that department. Mm. But it just goes to show how one man's meat is another man's poison. Well, you like it, I like it, mm. and at this moment in time, that's all that matters. Yes. So next time you may be thinking of ditching that hated piece, remember, it may be worth bringing along to a roadshow just to double check. That's just about it for another edition. More priceless moments tomorrow when some of our most eloquent experts reveal a few tricks of the trade. Furniture expert Orlando Rock shows us what life is like living above the shop. So Burley plays this amazing dual role between being a very public house that's open to a lot of visitors during the year and also very much our very fortunate family house. And houses like this must evolve. You've always got to keep pushing the boundaries. And we reveal some of the sauciest moments ever seen on the roadshow. I've been called the queen of saucy objects. I have no idea where this comes from. It makes me feel like a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> Good Lord. That's cheeky. Until next time, bye-bye. Jimmy Doherty continues his work in Darwin's Garden tomorrow at 8 on BBC Two. Next tonight, though, two London doctors are on the hunt for a nice big kitchen in Escape to the Country.